Our family is essentially done with money fights. Now, keeping on this budget that I'm going to explain in the video is saving me money, but this budget's also saving my sanity and keeping my family on it, saving my marriage. So it's important. And we're just over the stages of, do we have enough money for this? Can we afford eating out there? Should we go there instead? Why did you buy that? Did you check the budget first? Let's unpack this as we go through a few examples this week. Here's what that looks like for me. I spend more than my wife would at Home Depot. I'll go in there and I've got a specific project in mind. Like I have an irrigation lake in my backyard and I'm like, this is going to cost me $20, guarantee it. So by maybe the second or third trip to Home Depot after another like $5 part and $6 epoxy and $10 replacement, then, then it typically sometimes gets out of hand. And I know many of you know out there what that's like for home improvement projects. So when that budget line item pops up, it's like, oh yeah, I overspent on that one every once in a while because of this project or that project. But that was a one-time thing, right? But you know, one-time things, they tend to be every other month situations. And so maybe that's for me and for my wife, it would be, you know, Costco is the example or Target. And, and so you go in there and you're like, listen, I've just got to get one bag of dog food. This is a $35 trip and $350 later, we've got new Halloween costumes. We've got a great outfit. We've got this new supplement we need to try or just groceries that we probably will eat, but it may be not the thing that I picked up off the shelf or I would have chosen. And so there's a difference there between our, our spending habits and sometimes it's location-based. And so that's an example how getting on the same page with your spending is going to be the number one most helpful thing for your family. And it is for mine. That's why I mention it. So only 32% of U.S. households prepare a monthly budget. All right, 32% is what's currently preparing a monthly budget. If the average family was 1% more efficient in their budget, they'd retire with $100,000 more money. All right, so here's how I get to that number. 1% efficiency, if it's $50,000 income, which is low, the average is around 62 right now. So if we're just looking for simple math, say $50,000 annual income, and we have $500 that is an inefficiency. Okay. So we have maybe at the end of the year, you find yourself with the 500 extra dollars. Well, let's say you put that away once a year, just once a year, putting away that $500 at the end of the year, because you found a 1% inefficiency in your budget over the course of 30 years, then you would end up with a hundred thousand dollars. If you take the average household income, you take that 1% inefficiency. You invest it and over the course of just a 30 year term, you'd have a hundred thousand more dollars in your pocket at the end of that process. Now, little bits of money over the course of a long period of time can compound and grow for you. And that's why we want to look at our expenses and find those inefficiencies. That's the number one goal with this whole project. Here are three examples of different budgets that we've used historically, and one kind of evolves across the other. So the first one is going to be what I would call a bare bones option. And two columns, essential. And what I call discretionary, that's going to be things like your four wheels. Now that's housing, transportation, clothing, and food discretionary, it's everything else. And this is kind of where you get into the gray area of what is discretionary food and what is essential food. So for us, essential is as low as you can go. I mean, there's the rice and beans option all the way up to whether or not you're going to cut out that DoorDash fee this week. If you're asking me personally, my opinion is that DoorDash definitely lands itself over here. And you know, the basics peanut butter, rice, and beans. That's like your starting point over here on essentials for what you're going to be paying. Now you'll notice I left some space up top and down at the bottom. So for on this first example, this is where you list your income and in that space, you're going to have not just your paycheck as it actually comes in, but also any other nickels and dimes that you pick up. I mean, I'm talking about if you sell a t-shirt on Facebook marketplace for $5, that needs to be listed here. And then it needs to be put to work down here in these two columns. The net result at the bottom 
is going to be your long-term goals. And so for some of you, especially if you're starting out budgeting and you got this two column system, your long-term goal may be to make it to the end of the month without having spent more than you made. Down here, if you've got your goals listed out, start small and then build up from there. And it could be retirement goals, you know, kids, houses, you name it. Like, you know, just, just dream big. I love seeing goals down here that end up becoming assets and generate income. If you want to know how wealthy people are seeming to collect more and more value over time and more and more wealth, it, by having these goals serve the purpose of the income side, not just focused on expenses, because that comes from the income down, but really starting with your goals, having it influence your income and building up what you can then spend on and spend your money. All right, that first budget, the two column budget, that's a real paycheck to paycheck mindset. And that's a great starting place. But when you're ready to graduate from that and you're really starting to think month to month, that's when we get into more detailed categories. The next step is just to make this middle section more detailed. We're starting to break it out into specific goals for each of those. And some of those may be utilities, obviously. And I mentioned this first because some people think, well, you know, I always just spend a hundred dollars on water, you know, or $50 on water, whatever your amount is. But that goes up and down depending on what the time of year is. You know, you spend more on heating your house in the winter than you do in the summer. It seems, it seems like an obvious example, but this is the number one area where people always get that surprise in the mail. Oh my gosh, you know, we spent twice as much just by running air conditioning than we did last month on our electricity bill. So utilities is the one that surprises you most in the mail. The second one that surprises you most of the checkout is groceries. Okay. Groceries. I'll do a whole video about this coming up next week, but the average family is spending about $215 to $300 on groceries when it's just an individual or one couple, but a family of four, that amount goes all the way up to a thousand dollars on average. When you're ready to graduate from this two column approach, it's time to get specific with your categories. And this is where having not just a, a pen and paper or back of the napkin math that most of us start out doing, but really tracking your categorical spending and really looking at this more on a month to month basis, or maybe even starting out each week, you know, you've got your utilities, your groceries. These are things that tend to fluctuate and maybe you can cut back in some of your habits and spending, if you see that, or, you know, a budget is permission to spend. So if you find yourself stressed out at the grocery store, can we afford this giant thing of toilet paper? Do we need it? Eventually we will, but you know, maybe this thing is so much that it's going to outlive me. When you're looking at your grocery spending, if you know that you have money set aside for that, then it can be liberating. It can give you permission to spend that money. And one way to do that in the beginning is to have an envelope system. I'm not necessarily a great artist, but so you would literally go to the grocery store. You would have an envelope with groceries written on it. This is your like grandma's grandma's way of budgeting. And it's got a hundred dollars in there in cash. And you're not going to spend more than you have in that envelope because it's all the money you have on you in the envelope to go and do X, Y, or Z. We have technology and there's a lot of apps out there that can help you track your spending. And the key is to look before you swipe, look at your app before you go and swipe on things like groceries. But there's some other pitfalls that could be close for you. It could be like transportation in general. If you find yourself taking a lot of Ubers, maybe you got to take the bus, but there's a lot of different categories there. And your categories are going to need to be specific for you. And the best way to do that is to look back at your previous spending. So if you find yourself doing the two categories of what's essential and what's discretionary, and then you want to go one step deeper, start doing individual categories, I recommend picking six, six to 10 of where you spend the most money and starting to monitor those and then really learn more about your spend. This is a learning opportunity for you to develop your, your attention and your sense of self month to month when it comes to your budget. All right. So first we had the two column, then we had breaking it down to even more specific categories. And finally, your third example of a budget that we've used, and this is where we are now is to max out putting every dollar to work. So as money comes in, it's a specific role, not just with your, you know, 
essentials or discretionary spending in two categories, not just in like six or 10 categories, but we have a zero sum budget where every bit of income has a specific role. And some, some people do that here with, you know, a few larger categories and buckets to put money in. But when you have this progress to the stages, you get to example three, we found, and I find in my budget that I've got some left over. I've got money to work with. We're talking having extra money beyond retirement, beyond spending goals. And so then we get into the long-term mindset and not just thinking about, how, do I have enough money for this month and next month, but six months, 12 months, 18 months down the road. And this all really kind of boils down to your goals. Then there's all that stuff that shows up, you know, not on a monthly basis, maybe not even on a yearly basis, but you have all these things that we call sinking funds. A sinking fund is when you're taking money and setting it aside to replace your tires. You know, once, let's say like once every five years, you got your tires, your brakes, things like that. For me, it takes us about $73 a month to maintain our two automobiles, you know, over the course of their life. And what happens is it's not just $73 a month in and out in and out. It's $73 a month that builds up gradually over time. And then just like a few days ago, when I get a flat tire and we're going over to Costco to get that tire replaced and it's something that it gets slashed. It's a big headache. You know, no one enjoys it, but I've got true peace of mind because I've got $73 going into a sinking fund. And I know on average over the course of five years, that money is going to build up and then get depleted by a flat tire and build up and get depleted when the brakes are, are worn out. And so that's your auto maintenance sinking fund. And some of those others may be when you're saving up for one big expense, like a down payment, or if you're paying down principal on something, like there's all these different things that you could be saving up for or deploying money into that not a a regular expense, maybe it's not a long-term goal like retiring, but you know, some of those, you could get those big bills that come around, things like insurance. And if you play, pay annually for different plans and you don't want to derail all this good stuff you're doing. And so what we want to do is we want to, you know, really look at our transactions over the course of a 12 month or a three or a five year cycle. The way I find the best way to do this is with a spreadsheet, but in all reality, if you're really getting into that habit once a month of checking on your budget, categorizing, making sure that you're keeping your balance between your two columns, doing all this stuff up here on a monthly basis, you'll start to really notice where you're able to put that money and keep track of it. To sum things up, how I keep our family on a budget, here's three things to take home. One, definitely keep yourself on a routine reviewing your budget with your spouse. So my wife and I, we get together once a month and she brings the snacks and I bring the numbers because I'm the nerd and she's free spirit and that's totally fine. We get together once a month, we look through the transactions, the categories, and we look at our goals to see how our spending the previous month is impacting our future. Number two is we put every dollar that comes in to work. So for every time we make money, it could be a big commission check that comes in, or it could be $20 from selling some secondhand clothes on Facebook marketplace. We take that money and we put it to work. But number three is we avoid debt. And the way we do that is we only spend the money that we got. We don't spend money that we think we may get next month or next week's paycheck. So we only spend the money that's in the account. We only spend the money that we have in our hand and that keeps us on track. So to get you started, go ahead and sign up for our free newsletter and I'll give you three budgeting templates to track along with the three examples that we covered.